Hello and welcome to the fifth down huddle. Like and subscribe to the channel if you're on YouTube. Give it a follow if you're on Buzzsprout. If you're anywhere else and you're seeing this, tune in next week and I'll have another episode for you. But on YouTube, just to let you know, I do post daily videos, which usually more often than not are either the full podcast or clips from the podcast, meaning say if I, like last week I did NFC predictions for 2020. So I posted four videos throughout those next four days, each one, like one video for the NFC East, one video for the NFC West, one for the South, North, just so that when you, if you want to see, say you want to find out what I believe the Cowboys are going to have next season, you don't need to watch the entire podcast to figure that out. You can go right to my YouTube channel and find it there. At the same, It's the same name for everything, Fifth Down Huddle. Anyways, let's huddle up right away. We got a lot to talk about today. So the first thing comes with the coronavirus. There have been rumblings lately around the league office that have pushed forward the idea that we will, in fact, have NFL football in 2020. It's something that's been going around, this idea. There was one uh, reporter in the league that stated that, yes, we will have NFL football in 2020, and that is pretty much a go-to guarantee for the league office. Now, some different ideas in the front office have that the front office have had for that include starting the season in October, having no bye weeks, or maybe even pushing the season back altogether by nearly a month, meaning a Super Bowl in late February or early March. Now, granted, these are interesting ideas, so don't expect any of this to necessarily mean anything specific is going to change for sure. These are all just rumblings, rumors, but I think it brings up a big question we need to ask, which is whether or not we should have football at all this year. Now, again, I believe the Lee office is juggling this question as well. And a lot of this has to do with the numbers that correlate with coronavirus, with big crowds, with football games, with just the general public. Um, And as of today, Wednesday, May 6th, there have been approximately 3.8 million confirmed cases and approximately 263,000 deaths worldwide. Now, as we know, the NFL stays within America's borders. And yes, the NFL plans on playing a game or two outside of the country, but that's an easy fix. You just have them play at either that team's home field or the other team's home field. So it's an easy change if they don't want to fly people outside of the country or if we still have travel bans in place by then. So then following that, we have to look at the numbers within the United States or the trend within the United States. And the United States is currently nearly 1 million cases higher than the next country on the list, which is Spain currently with over 250,000 confirmed cases, which puts the U.S. at above nearly 1.2 million confirmed cases cases. Now keep in mind this doesn't mean live cases. There's a big difference there. Live cases are cases that either one, um, the patient hasn't recovered yet. and That's pretty much the only thing. Either they haven't recovered yet or they haven't died yet. Um, so basically it just means you have the disease now. So that doesn't account for, the 1.2 million count does not account for those that have recovered or those that have sadly passed. But it's still a scary number to look at. Now, the NFL has a really, really big choice to make. Clearly, the situation within the U.S. has not become much safer than it was one month ago. I mean, granted, the curve has started to flatten, but one problem is the moment you start to open up without a vaccine, that curve will shoot back up again. The only reason it's flattening is because everything is closed down. Now, personally, I'm no I'm no expert at this, so I can't guarantee that the curve would rise, but if I had to bet money on it, I wouldn't take the risk. I really wouldn't take that risk. Now, clearly, the situation in the U.S., like I said, hasn't become much better, but we can only pray that things begin to drastically deteriorate, deteriorate if we hope to have fans at our 2020 NFL games. Now, one possibility that has been discussed that kind of goes along with what I just said is social distancing within stadiums, if fans are even allowed at the stadium in the first place. Now, the respective teams wouldn't have too much ability to social distance, while they're on the field at least, but the fans have that ability. And any ability to make the game safer in a time like this, I assure you they're going to go ahead and do it. Now, say you have a stadium that allows 80,000 people normally. 
big football stadium allows 80,000 people, or at least a maximum capacity of 80,000 people. Now let's say we bring it down to 20,000 in order to social distance. You see, but then you have the problems that come with needing to navigate the stadium itself. Even if you have, say, four chairs in between every fan, or every family of fans, because the families are already living together, so they don't necessarily need to social distance, but between every ticket holder group, every buyer, per se, people buy tickets and bundles if they're bringing three of their friends or if their whole family's going to the game, four chairs in between everybody. You see, but then you have the problems that come with needing to navigate the stadium itself. Using the bathroom, getting food, simply walking in and out. Now granted, it's not 80,000 people anymore, but 20,000 people is still really hard to control in that situation. At any given time during the game, excluding halftime and excluding quarter breaks and timeouts, the beginning and the end of games, there's going to be around at least 200 to 300 people out of their seat out of those 20,000, at least, best case scenario, because people need to use the bathroom. People get hungry. People get dry mouths. People need to get up and walk around. Now, there, these are, those are two reasons why I see it as a real, real possibility that we will have an NFL season, but just without any fans in the stadium. And it's sad, I know, but at some point you have to draw a line where... Our want for entertainment needs to be halted for the sake of human lives. And honestly, I'm against reopening some of the public places that we are seeing being opened already. But again, I'm also no scientist and I'm no economic expert. All I know is that if we reopen too fast, cases will likely spike again. And we'll start this process all over again. So should the NFL have football in 2020? If I was the commissioner, I'd say yes, but no fans unless a dramatic decrease in the spread of COVID-19 happens quickly, or we have a big breakthrough in terms of a vaccine. Now, another interesting factor with this, with the possibility of not having fans in the stadium, is the effect it has on players. Because a big, big time effect that comes on players, especially rookie quarterbacks, is the pressure. The pressure on them. A lot of that pressure goes away when there's nobody watching. It's a lot harder to play the quarterback position, to kick a field goal, to do those, you know, big time things. It's a lot easier to do it on the practice field. It's a lot easier to make the team then because there's nobody watching you. You're not under the pressure. It doesn't count as much. And granted, it will count. But the thing is, I wonder the psychological effect that no fans would have on the players, especially young quarterbacks like Joe Burrow. If we have an NFL season, Without fans, we could see these rookie quarterbacks flourish right away. Granted, the same problems will come with playing an NFL defense, but without the fans, without that same football NFL game day action, it's going to be really hard for them to get into that big-time game-time mentality. No fans, it almost feels like a scrimmage or high school practice. It'll be really, really interesting to see how that affects the players if, of course, it happens. I mean, if we even have the NFL season at all. Like I said, there's just so many questions that go along with the possibility of social distancing within the, um, within the 20,000 people, maybe, that they would allow. Um, or 15,000, or maybe even 10,000. Um, the social distancing, it's, it's really, really hard to do. You can, you can think up solutions like, hey, you know, let's draw, let's draw lines in the ground to make it so that, you know, there's lanes that you have to go through in order to social distance. Well, there's really not much of a way to control that. You're going to have your people that care about it and the people that aren't really going to pay too much attention to it. They're there to watch a football game. And the majority of people that buy a ticket to go to a football game with 20,000 people in a time like this are not going to be the ones who are overly superstitious about the virus. The people who are going to end up going there are the ones who, in fact, don't care that much, or at least don't see it as as big of a threat. If you do see it as a large threat, chances are you aren't going to go somewhere where 20,000 other people are going to be. So my final conclusion is that if I had to bet, I'd say that we do have football in 2020. 
but I would be extremely surprised if we have fans there and if we have fans there without a vaccine. Another thing I want to talk about, something I kind of want to come back to, are my AFC South predictions. And I had a few angry responses to that, and I understand. You know, when you make predictions, fans are going to get annoyed when, say, they had a nice offseason, they had some few big signings, a couple big additions, and all of a sudden you say, yeah, you're not making the playoffs. I understand, but, you know, <laughs> 14 teams are going to make the playoffs. All right, 14 teams are going to make the playoffs. Simple as that. That means 18 teams are not. So I have to pick 18 teams that aren't going to make the playoffs, and if your team isn't there, I'm sorry, but... That's how it is. Now, I won't leave it at that, but the point of a prediction is that I might be wrong. It's not me saying that it'll definitely happen, but if I had to bet a million dollars on it, that's what I would go with. Um, and here, let, let me provide some more reasoning to what I said about the AFC South. Um, I have the Texans at the top not only because they have a recent history of success, but because they didn't get too much worse over the offseason. I'm not trying to downplay their loss in DeAndre Hopkins, but they got a replacement. Did they get another DeAndre Hopkins? No, not at all. But they did still get a solid receiver. Watson is a great quarterback, and I feel like he's still going to be able to work well. It's still a solid receiving core. It's not like it all of a sudden got terrible because it lost DeAndre Hopkins. Granted, it's not as dominant anymore, but it will still be strong. Not to mention... They have a great low-risk, high-reward player in David Johnson. David Johnson hasn't panned out lately. And I'm not sure if he will this season, but I bet that if he does, the run game will make Hopkins' loss much, much less impactful on offensive production. If, if, you, if you're running the ball more, if you have a solid running back, a solid run game, losing a big-time receiver like DeAndre Hopkins will not hurt your team as much as it would if you were reliant on the pass game. So we'll see. But I have the Texans at the top for those simple reasons. Now moving on to the next team, the Jaguars. Now one main response, and I understand this, was bewilderment in the form of why in the fuck are the Jags above the Titans. I have one reason. Gardner Minshew. I'm a believer in Minshew mania, and I believe that Minshew has a lot of heart in the game of football. He loves the game. You can tell it when he plays. Now, I'm not trying to say that he's the only player in the NFL that loves the game. No, but he has a lot of heart, and a lot of heart transfers right to the field. He doesn't seem afraid when he walks out on the field. He doesn't seem that nervous. He seems like he knows what he's there to do, and he knows he's going to get it done. And I honestly feel like he's going to bring that heart right back into the Jags' offense, just like he did this year. That's how Minshew, Minshew Mania got started. That's how he amplified the Jaguars' offense. Now, he didn't make it stellar, but he amplified it. Now, ultimately, both the Jaguars and the Titans will make the playoffs, but it will be really, really close. Like I said, heart can take you a long way, and we saw that in the relatively recent Colts. No... Not this year's Colts, but the year before that in 2018 when they made the playoffs. Now, ultimately, like I said, both the Jags and Titans will make the playoffs. The Titans just paid big money on a big deal, not insane money, but big money on a big deal to Tannehill under the impression that their run game will continue to be as strong as it is. I think I don't think they gave that money to Tannehill because their run game is really good. No, they gave that money to Tannehill because Tannehill didn't screw the team over. A lot of quarterbacks that you put in nowadays fall under the pressure. And they fall apart and they mess up your team. You want a quarterback who isn't going to throw interceptions that end the game for you. Tannehill didn't do that last year, and that's why they want him back. Although, I feel like we often forget where players come from. Why is Tannehill so successful all of a sudden? Where was he before the Titans? Or at least he's paid for a starting role now. Now, it's because Tannehill is a solid quarterback. I'm not trying to downplay Tannehill's talent at all. He's a solid quarterback. He's got a good arm. He's got good accuracy. He can make good decisions. But only if you don't need to rely on his arm to win you the game. He was on a bad team with the Dolphins. And we saw that he couldn't turn that team around. Even when they had a little bit of talent here and there offensively, he still couldn't make it happen. 
Now, it's because Tannehill isn't the type of player to hold a team together. He is the type of player that fits in like a puzzle piece, like a Dak Prescott, like a Kirk Cousins. He will fit in like a puzzle piece as long as the other puzzle pieces fit too. We saw that last year with the Titans. He fit well. He could make the throws as long as you didn't ask him to throw it 40 times in a game down the entire time. As long as he didn't have to do that, he was a solid quarterback. And Tannehill is not the quarterback you want to rely on to win the game. Now let me connect this to what I'm going to say next. This year, Derrick Henry will not be as dominant. And that will be precisely why Tannehill fails as well. The Titans, they're a great team. They have a nice roster. They've got a solid defense, solid offensive line. Great running back in Derrick Henry. But I don't believe Derrick Henry will be quite as dominant as he was this year. My reasoning for that? Last year it was kind of out of the blue. Derrick Henry's been in the league for a good while now. Now, Granted, not a super long career, but a good few years. How come we didn't see as that much dominance until this year? It's an interesting question, and you you can kind of... Uh, bring that back to Tannehill, to the fact that they had a solid quarterback in Tannehill who could make the right throws. That could be a big reason for it. But, Derrick Henry is not an insanely elusive running back. He's big and he's strong, and he will make you miss. No, he won't make you miss, but he'll make it so you simply can't tackle the guy. He's big and he's strong, and he will charge through you. And I guarantee you, Here's the thing. I'm trying to connect my thoughts here, but here's the thing. Derrick Henry, I'm not saying he's not a great running back. He is. He'll still have success, but I don't think the Titans are going to be able to ride on that success anymore like they did last year. Derrick Henry's a solid running back. I'm just trying to pin that down to make you know that he's a solid running back. He's a great running back. But... Teams watch film. Teams learn from their mistakes. Even the teams that didn't play against the Titans will figure out a way to prepare for him. It's really, really hard to prepare for a big-dime player like that in his first year. It really is. But in this second season, I guarantee you, the second season of this Derrick Henry run, where he's all of a sudden this amazing dominant running back, I simply don't believe he will have that same level of dominance this year. Now, finally, the Colts. The Colts don't have a solid quarterback, and that is why they will fail. Rivers will realize he waited a season too long to retire and will fall apart on the field this coming season. He fit well with Chargers. Now he has to learn an entirely new offense, get set with a whole new team, Right on the brink of retirement. That's a hard thing to do. Now I'm a little more optimistic with Brady. Because Brady was still having success. Even when he went to the Buccaneers. But Phillip Rivers did not find a lot of success last year. He didn't. So that's why I'm a little less. Or quite a bit less optimistic about Rivers. I'm optimistic about Brady. Because Brady's been having success for the last 20 years. And hasn't shown a lot of fumbling in that. I don't mean literal fumbling. But figuratively. He hasn't fumbled around his career a lot. But Rivers, we saw a drop-off this past season. And I don't think that him going to the Colts is going to change that. I think he's going to continue to fall, and I think he's going to realize, I should have retired last year. I should have retired a Charger, shouldn't have gone to the Colts. He said he feels like he has at least one more year in him. But honestly, I don't believe Rivers is the quarterback for the Colts, and I don't believe Brissett is either. Brissett's a solid quarterback, but he's not a guy to turn the team around. He isn't. Now, the Colts don't need a big turnaround. They were in the playoffs in 2018. But again, the Colts will not succeed this year. They have Phillip Rivers at quarterback, and that's going to be their downfall. That's going to be what kills them. So the final topic I wanted to look at today, now it's one that's going to take a little while here, is revisiting my Nikhil Harry video. I I made a video about, I think, three months ago about Nikhil Harry and about whether or not I thought he was a bust. Um, 
Now look, Nikhil Harry didn't have a very good first season at all. He never broke 100 yards in a game, not even 50. Nikhil Harry failed in his rookie year. We have to face that. Despite what his future may hold, I want us all to come to terms with the simple fact that Nikhil Harry failed in his rookie year. And quite honestly, is a draft bust up to this point. But how so? The Patriots drafted him for one reason. Well, two reasons if you account that they think he can be a future threat. But primarily for one reason. A deep threat who could stretch the field and turn the defense around. Did he do this? Not at all. Over his first seven NFL games, he only did play seven NFL games this season. Another reason why he failed. Nikhil Harry racked up 12 catches for 105 yards and two touchdowns. He broke 100 yards, but it took him seven games to do it. And only caught two touchdown passes. Compare this to the other 2019 rookie wide receivers like Terry McLaurin, who racked up over 900 yards and seven touchdowns in 14 games. And that looks down on Nikhil Harry. It really does, because it, it... Just looking at those stats, it really, really seems like Nikhil Harry is not a good receiver at all. It's like, geez, all these other great receivers were available and they chose him? Come on, man. Then we also have to look to the fact that Terry McLaurin did only play 14 games. Or did play 14 games and Nikhil Harry only played 7. The Marquise Brown, another rookie, had 584 yards and 7 touchdowns. A.J. Brown had over 1,008 touchdowns, and both of those stat lineups, including Terry McLaurin's, drastically outshine Nikhil Harry's stats for his rookie season, even when you bring it down to the same number of games and round out the average, all those receivers still did far better than Nikhil Harry. Apart from this, though, we need to look at how Patriot stars have fared in their first season with the team. Looking at Nikhil Harry, was this all his fault? Like I said, only 105 yards and two touchdowns. No, that was not his fault completely. He was injured. That's a tough, tough thing to go through. And he was put on injured reserve. So he was thrown into the team mid-season. Late season, actually, when you really look at it. But he didn't really have a chance to play the whole season with the team. He didn't have a chance to be a Patriot for a full year. And I think that really, really, really hurt how well he performed in year one. I think the Patriots chose him out of the idea that he could be the one that could perform the quickest. The Patriots needed an offensive deep threat. And they thought, hey, Nikhil Harry, let's see. Let's see if you can do it. And he got injured. It's a tough thing. So he failed his first year. He did. We have to come to terms with that. He failed in his first year purpose. But again, let's look at how other Patriots rookies have fared early on. Let's look towards Rob Gronkowski. In his first year with the Patriots, he played in all 16 games and only caught 42 passes for just 500 yards and 10 touchdowns. 10 touchdowns is a big number, but again, only 500 yards. And he is a tight end, so that's still really good for a rookie year. Now, if you use that stat line to estimate what Gronk would have racked up in only 7 games, which is also how many games Nikhil Harry played this year, when you do that math, you'll find out that Gronk arguably the best tight end of all time, would have only had 233 yards and four touchdowns in that span. And not to mention, Nikhil Harry joined the offense midseason and came off an injury that we can only assume continued to hold him back when his return came around. Compare the stats from Gronk's rookie year to his following year, and the output is incredible. In just his second year, Gronk put up 17 touchdowns and over 1,300 yards. Over 1,300 yards. Another example to look to is Julian Edelman. He only played 12 games in his rookie year, and he gathered together 359 yards and a single touchdown over the course of that time. Translate that to seven games, again comparing it to rookie Nikhil Harry. He would have gotten 209 yards and a single touchdown over that stretch. Not much better than Nikhil Harry. So when factoring in the fact that Nikhil Harry was not able to practice with the first team offense all regular season, was not in the game plan for the majority of the season, Josh McDaniels kind of had to throw him in there, 
as well as the fact that he was coming fresh off an injury, one can argue that he is completely unproven in either direction of the initial question. The secondary question asking, did he serve his purpose in his first year? No, he didn't serve his purpose. But in the further question of, is he a forever draft bust? We don't really know. The door is still wide open for Nikhil Harry to make a Gronk or Edelman-sized impact on this team. The overall conclusion that I have to come to is that he is not a bust if we look towards the future. Arguably, he has the highest ceiling of anyone on the Patriots roster right now besides maybe Jarrett Stidham. And if he is coached well and learns to use his physical gifts, which he has a lot of, it's why he was drafted so early. He could easily be one of the best receivers in Patriots history. That's a bold claim to make. It is. But how many receivers that are so-called the best in Patriots history were drafted in the first round? That's another thing to look at. If we look toward why they initially drafted him, though, like I've said before, and I'll say it again, one can only assume that it was to solve the very clear issues at the wide receiver position. Some big news, again, that came out with Brady leaving was the fact that Brady was pissed off. He didn't have a receiving core around him to throw to. He did, but was it any good? Was it one you could rely on? Was it one that you could win a Super Bowl with? That's an arguable comment. He didn't have a run game either. Sony Michelle didn't break 100 yards once this season. That's their starting running back. I mean, come on. <laughs> Sony Michelle didn't do great this year. The offensive line was all over the place this year in ter- with injuries, with blood clots in the center, with the left tackle. I forgot his name, but honestly, I'm quite happy I did because he was worth nothing this year. The Patriots were. Honestly, a bunch of spare parts put together. And it was, like, it, just, it was like watching a car that's driving down the road constantly. You know, a wheel falls off here. You know, a wheel falls off there. Uh, you know, the side view mirror gets blown off. And they keep trying to fix it while they drive. They don't bother stopping the car. They just keep trying to drive forward. And the car is really struggling. Because with every piece it loses, you, you try to shove in another piece in there. But it's just not the same. You could see it, you know, they tried to shove in Antonio Brown, didn't work out. Tried to shove in Mohamed Sanu, didn't really work out. Besides the first game he was in. So therefore, he could be considered a bust when thinking about why they drafted him in the first place. He really could. But again, my conclusion that I've come to is the thing is, he could eventually turn into a thousand yard per season regular. Therefore, if that happens, being a draft boom, again, look back to Edelman, look back to Gronk. We can't base Nikhil Harry's first season on the rest of his career, especially when you bring in all the things that are really not football skill related, like an injury, like being thrown into the offense in the middle of the season. Because of those things, Nikhil Harry, I don't believe, is a bust. I have hope in this kid. He has physical potential. He has speed. He has height. He has jumping ability. He has catching ability. He can make plays with the ball in his hands. We saw that in college, and it'll be really, really interesting if we start to see that on the NFL football field this year. But I don't think it's over for Nikhil Harry. There's a reason he's still on the team. It's because you can't really blame him for what happened this past season. So is he a bust? No. Not yet. So anyways, thank you so, so much for watching the episode. Again, check me out on YouTube. I'll be posting each segment of this podcast there. The full podcast is always on Spotify or Buzzsprout or YouTube even. And soon I'll have it up on Apple Podcasts. But either way, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.